the way that you talk to yourself, that's a big, mm. you know. Yeah. I yeah. think we're very uh, harsh critics to ourselves. Yes. Um, oh, you, you know, you're an idiot. You're a piece of shit. You're whatever it is, right? Yeah. Uh, stopping all of that or, or trying to, you know, putting the reps in there. Mm. Um, movement and physical activity has been huge for me. So knowing when to push yourself uh, and knowing, like, and you have to decide, like, at, at what is, because I, I, I tend to work out really hard. Yeah. Um, so what is self-care and what is self-loathing, mm. <laughs> you know? Welcome to ABG, Asian Boss Girl, a podcast for the modern day Asian American woman. My name is Janet and I co-host this show with Helen and Mel. And today we have a very special guest, Mr. John Kim, who is also known as the Angry Therapist. On the show, Helen and Mel and myself have often talked a lot about our own personal mental health journeys. We've talked about um, therapy, we've talked about upkeeping our mental health, and we've invited a lot of guests to talk about this topic who are mostly of the uh, female background. And, um, you know, it's been really great to get their perspective, but I'm super excited today to be able to share your story, John, mm -hmm. and to have some of the advice that you might be able to offer to some of our listeners. So yeah, let's get started. <laughs> yeah, let's do. And the uh, num number one rule of um, a therapist is not to give advice. So ah, um, I will indirectly. Indirectly. Yeah. Yes, not that inspire. this is therapy. Yeah. Through, through sharing stories and, yes. and revelations, of course. Yeah. Actually, before we get into kind of the topic of conversation, I do want to share more in detail about your background. Yes. Because you have, um, you've done some incredible things. He has a very valuable perspective as a licensed therapist and a life coach and also a CrossFit enthusiast. Mm -hmm. And he's also the co-founder of Tat Lab and Lumia Coach Training. And not only that, but also the best-selling author of books like I Used to Be a Miserable Fuck and Every Man's Guide to a Meaningful Life and Single on Purpose, Redefine Everything, Find Yourself First. Um, I have recently gone through a breakup, so oh. I very much resonate with Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I should have brought you my book. After going through a divorce, uh, John actually launched a blog in 2010 that documented his self-development journey. That attracted his first coaching clients, and he quickly built a community, both online and offline, of people who valued his vulnerable, frank approach to life and self-improvement. John became a pioneer of the online life coaching movement and became known as the unconventional therapist who worked out of the box. Today, John's work helps people in a multitude of ways through a variety of channels. Um, he hosts in-person retreats, online courses, books, YouTube, and even daily life insight texts, which um, I think is an, is an incredible approach or thing to offer to individuals. <laughs> he co-authored the book, It's Not Me, It's You, Break the Blame Cycle, Relationship Better, with his um, partner and fellow therapist, Vanessa Bennett. Um, so that's a little bit about all of the things that you've done. Yeah. And, uh, I'm curious though, before getting into all of this work with the angry therapist, uh, can you share with our listeners a little bit about your background? How did you grow up? What was yeah. life like? What were some of your like previous aspirations before coming into this line of work and, um, then, and the stuff that you do today? Yes. Uh, I'm Korean American, came here when I was three. Um, I'm older, so I'm 50. So I grew up in the eighties. Mm. in Roland Heights when Roland, I know it's all Asian now, but yeah, it was, yeah. it was all Caucasian and, uh, and Hispanic. And we were the only, um, Korean family for like miles. I, I mean, wow, I was one yeah. of the only Asian kids in school. And, uh, at that time, um, it's not like how it is now where, uh, growing up in the eighties, Asian people were, uh, they were made fun of. Mm -hmm. Um, I was embarrassed uh, to be Asian because, um, all the cool kids were white and yes. they had blue eyes. And so lots of um, um, shame and uh, disconnect from uh, self and culture. Yes. You know, yeah, like yeah. Korean food, right? Yeah. Friends would come over and, you know, what's that stinky shit? Y'all always get made fun of. Yeah. Um, when I started having crushes uh, on girls, um, I had this crush on one girl who would come over and just because um, there was kimchi or something that wasn't, American in the house that was that was foreign to them, um, they'd, they'd, she wouldn't like me anymore. You it know, it would so, be a turn off for her all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah and so yeah. internalizing that, um, mm. and I was just telling a friend that today, I don't think other people see it, but because I have one foot in the eighties and 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 of course one foot here now yeah. today, um, it's opened so much like media, yeah. like 
you know, uh, Emmys and, you know, mm. shows like, uh, and you guys mentioned um, Beef yeah. with that one line about the the, the Western therapy, therapy right? if it works on Eastern minds. Yeah. I mean, uh, just it's it's such a great time, I think. Well, you guys also, you know? Yeah. Pod, it's yeah. like, it's, um, it's not how I grew up. So it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, yeah. I resonate with your story in the way that um, I grew up also in a mostly Caucasian community. Mm. Um, more Orange County area okay. near Capstrano Valley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, or south of, south of Irvine. So there's definitely enclaves of like Asian communities. Right. Um, and I grew up, I'm a child of like more of like maybe the nineties and, and 2000s. Okay. Um, but very much of that mindset of like, um, or actually I feel like the period that I grew up, it was actually more about embracing all of like different mm, ethnicities. Yeah, yeah. And so it was a little bit more of a, um, a mental twist for me because I felt like I was being told that I am equal and mm -hmm. yet you pick up on kind of nuanced ways that people might look at you differently. Right. right like even right. just a slight nuance, like children don't know they come to your house and they might react negatively to something Yeah. and, um, yeah. they're not trying to, to make you feel othered, but you do. And then you're in your mind thinking, wait, but I, I'm being told at school and in mm. my community that I am just the same as everyone else. So yeah. sometimes it gets a little bit, it's a little bit strange to kind of like come to terms with your identity, yes. right? And your yes. sense of self-confidence. Yeah, I can imagine Orange County, um, that whole that whole scene. But in the 90s, uh, this is, uh, I mean, the, like movies like The Fast and Furious have already, already come out, right? They had, So it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't like- It was, yeah. Like, um, uh, who's the guy, uh, this is really way back, but um, they, they used to tape- um, White people used to tape their eyes back to play Asian people, yeah, like, like that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff. Jerry yeah. Lewis kind of stuff. Mm, you know? Yeah, um, that's before my generation, but but me kind of growing up in the 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 residue of byproduct of that. Right, that world, right. You know? Yeah, tell me a little bit more about that. Like, I mean, you shared a bit of the the color on that, but like, what are some experiences that you had as a child that really I, impacted? I got really lucky. I don't know about you, but I got really lucky. Um, it seemed like when I was growing up, they let one Asian kid into the cool, cool, cool group. Mm, so you were um, the cool Asian kid. And, but you had to, yeah. you had to um, um, be able to do something. Mm. So I skated. You know, I was a f the first kid to uh, pop a wheelie uh, around my entire block. I was a break dancer. Wow. So um, I'm into uh, very physical stuff. You yeah, know, like yeah. Riding motorcycles and dirt bikes and stuff. Mm. And so as a kid, that really helped me because it got me um, from not being bullied. Mm, you know? I see, I see. Yeah. But the I, Asians around me were all getting beat up mm, and bullied. And yeah, it was horrible, you know. And, but that, that inner child of you, that kind of, or that type of like identity, mm -hmm. um, how, I guess, describing kind of from that. And then as you go into um, like developing into later adulthood and everything, yes. how, how did all of that kind of like change or shift for you? Yeah, this is a great uh, segue. I think as we grow up and life happens and, you know, we get into relationships, we, you know, get married, have kids, all that kind of stuff, chase the corner office, office um, we start disconnecting with that, um, what I call the, 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 the solid self, right? Mm -hmm. The authentic self. And um, we start living with a lot of shoulds, like we should right, right. dress this way or be this way. Um, so after my divorce, the first question I asked myself was, um, what would it look like to connect to that 10 year old again? Mm, you know, the one that was yeah. breakdancing and felt free. And um, did I lose a, that connection, that relationship with myself? Mm. And so I started there and, um, you know, I, I was freshly divorced. Uh, I didn't have a job. I was broke. I was just, I mean, really like just getting on Craigslist, finding a roommate, starting all over at 35. Yeah. And I, and, you know, sometimes when you have nothing, it's, it's easier because you have nothing to lose. I totally agree with yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I started with that question and then I started to pull from what would it look like to pull from that, that solid self. Mm -hmm. And then every decision, decision I made, so whether it was, um, um, my relationships or what I wanted for lunch, you know, mm. If you're like me and know all the lyrics to NSYNC songs and wore Jessica McClintock prom dresses, you're a millennial. And if you're a millennial, it's time to add Clarins Multi-Active Cream to your daily routine. You've been adulting for a while, so the daily stress of binging the third season of Gossip Girl until 2 a.m. instead of getting the recommended eight hours of sleep can cause stress aging. Yes, it's a thing. The good news? Europe's number one skincare line has a solution you can trust. I'll be honest and say that I've noticed the aging lines coming through. I feel like it adds a bit of character, but I also want to take care of my skin when it's stressed. 
Clarence Multi-Active Cream has been clinically proven to target the first visible signs of aging by smoothing lines and wrinkles, refining pores, evening tone and texture, and strengthening the skin's moisture barrier. With the move and the change in climate, my skin has been stressed out. So I've been using Multi-Active for about a week and I can already tell the difference. This cream does a lot. It makes my fine lines look smaller, refines my skin's texture, and gives me the 24-hour hydration, even though the heater is blasting. Go to Clarence.com slash ABG and get multi-active day and night cream for 10% off, a free welcome gift, plus free shipping on your first order. That's C-L-A-R-I-N-S dot com slash ABG with promo code ABG. Clarence.com slash ABG with promo code ABG. So everything from the simple to the big questions, Mm -hmm. like, um, I mean, how did you identify that the, of, of going back to that inner person, like what I imagine when all of these things are happening in your yeah. life externally, yeah. it kind of can feel like there's so much going on sure. and you don't really know what to anchor to or how to. It's usually know. the quiet whisper because we usually ignore it, right? Mm. The the thundering voice is our pseudo self. That's the, the, the side of us that's like, you know, uh, the, the, the clock is ticking. You need to get married. Mm. You need to have kids or. Um, go for the job that has the 401k or, you know, right, right. it's a lot of uh, structured logic, left brain. Yeah. And also like, you know, um, having Asian parents, like old school Asian parents um, who want you to be quote unquote successful. And to them, it's, you know, doctor, lawyer. Right, right. right? Um, marry a Korean woman and, you know, babies and all that. But it wasn't honest to me. So uh, ignoring the thundering voices, because uh, that's what we're used to listening to. And then seeing if you can actually start listening to the the quiet voice, Mm. which is hard to do. It is, yeah. Yeah. How, like, are there some, I guess, like, key moments that you remember that helped you listen to that voice? Yeah. Well, uh, the first thing I did was um, I bought a motorcycle. Mm. And um, it had meaning because um, everyone I've been with romantically said no, which is fine. I get it. They're dangerous. Uh, In the 80s, my parents said no. uh, Dirt bikes are dangerous. Um, I just got no my entire life, but mm. I was a kid who on a little scooter felt the most free mm. and, um, I love machines and I, it was just mm. very, you know, and I've always wanted one. So when I got a divorce, I was like, fuck it. No one's going to tell me no. Yeah, I'm 35. Yeah. I'm sending my parents a voicemail. I'm going to buy a motorcycle. And so I spent a lot of time, um, streets of K-Town and all over, all over LA, um, just writing this thing. Yeah. And what's interesting is it's kind of a meditation machine because you got to be really present or you're, you're going to die. Yeah. Yeah. So you're hitting flow states, you're mm. calming your, your nervous system and you're alone. So it's like mm. you're almost establishing a relationship with yourself. Right. Right. So I, I tell people I found myself through motorcycles. Um, I, I discovered fitness, CrossFit, so motorcycles, barbells. And then I say donuts just because allowing yourself <laughs> to have a treat once in a while. Yeah. 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 The thing that I kind of tied or that I really like that stood out to me in your story was when there's so much going on to be able to cling on to the thing that maybe you felt the most resistance from outside mm-hmm. people to, mm-hmm. um, and was then is the kind of the thing that you went towards yeah. that you felt the strongest internal pull from, but you got the most resistant externally from. Yes. And when you have the courage to listen to that quiet whisper and actually put action behind it, um, there's a reunion, mm. you know, there's a reunion because I think when we're kids, that quiet whisper is actually the loudest Mm, because you're not tainted yet. Yes. You're not approval seeking. You're just, you know, eating ants and and the day is wide and you're curious about everything and you're playful and you're not, you know, and then as we grow up, um, we get hurt and then Mm. we, you know, there's consequences and we've got to pay taxes. All this stuff happens. And I think we start living um, outside in instead of inside out. Mm, outside in instead of inside out. Yeah. That's, I, I really like that statement. Yeah. Especially, I think, Asians <laughs> yes, <laughs> because of our parents. Yeah. 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 So you, I like that you said, um, you sent your parents to voicemail. Yes. yes. How did, how, like, how really did that conversation kind of happen? Or what was that dynamic like when um, you're going through these shifts? M- my dad was an alcoholic and very dependent, codependent on his two sons. Mm. Um, I got lucky because I was the youngest. So I got to go play while my brother at like 14 was you know, uh, sorting out mail and helping my, my parents mm. um, pay bills and all that. And so uh, my dad would call us um, nine one tech, uh, back when pages were around, pages 911 um, if the uh, the batteries on the remote control were dead. Mm. That kind of stuff. Like constantly call us wanting something that he could 
to himself. Right, I see. And if we didn't do it, he would say, well, you know, we came to America for you kind of thing, uh, you know? And yeah, so yeah. Um, eventually I had to draw some boundaries and um, I just started sending him, I just didn't answer. Yeah. You know, and of course there was pushback and anger and, you know, um, from an alcoholic, the response would be, oh, well, you don't love me anymore? Like, what is it, you mm. know? But um, they don't, they don't disown you. They, right, they right. They adjust, you know? And, I, and also I was 35. I wasn't like 20. Yeah. So it took me a while, but yeah. It is, I think it, it takes oftentimes a lot of, a lot of um, maturing and, yeah. and um, to be able to kind of like, to be able to, I guess, to establish that boundary. It's crazy how the smallest actions can have the greatest impact. Whether it's the ending statement of have a good weekend to your cashier to just making your bed in the morning, it all enhances your mood. Again, small actions can have big benefits, like how you take care of your gut can support whole body health. I shared my gut issues over a handful of times on the podcast by now, but just as a refresher, I've been intentionally changing my diet and habits to support my gut because it wasn't very happy. I'll spare you all the TMI details. And one habit I've been implementing is taking Seeds DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic, and wow, it helps so much. I have less digestion issues and I go regularly now, which is my biggest struggle. Also, I don't know about you, but my digestion always acts up when I'm traveling. So I bought the daily symbiotic with me and it changed the game. I no longer was backed up or constipated and I could just go. Seed is very much part of my daily morning routine. I take it first thing in the morning after I wake up along with my other daily vitamins. And there's a reason why you see seed everywhere. It's used and loved by so many. I personally feel like they did all the thorough research and scientific testing to assure results. Again, your body is an ecosystem and great health starts in the gut. Trust your gut with C's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic. Go to C.com slash ABG and use code 25ABG to get 25% off your first month. That's 25% off your first month of C's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic at C.com slash ABG, code 25ABG. How would you kind of provide guidance. I know we don't want to give advice, but for people who do feel like they struggle with creating boundaries. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, having a conversation first is the best, but my parents, uh, speak little English. I speak little Korean. So, uh, and also, you know, trying to sit down with them and have a conversation that is deeper is, yeah. is really hard to do. Um, so I think they would have, um, they would have twisted it like, like, you know, like that you don't mm. love me. You know, if I, if I, if I said to my dad, you know, um, can you not call me as much or I, I love you, but can you change your own batteries and your remote control mm. or can you, whatever it is, uh, can you call a cable company? Can you, um, I think those, those tracks were laid and they were so deep that, uh, he wouldn't have understood Right, right. And so for me, I had to draw a high, harder line and uh, the conversation, there, there isn't much of a conversation there. Yeah. But for most people, yeah, I think you start with uh, an honest conversation with your parents, um, bringing it back to you how you feel and what you're willing to do and not and not do anymore. Yeah. You know, it's a hard, it takes a lot of courage. I mean, one of the things that stands out to me about your story is I, you're saying sending them to voicemail yeah. and then learning to just stop responding. So sometimes maybe yes. creating boundaries is yeah. creating silence because when language can be a barrier and with like um, expectations and yeah. understanding, sometimes just yeah. stopping the, the pattern or the cycle of like communication can yeah. be the first sign for them to figure out, you know, how do we yes, okay. after they after they um, get hurt and angry and and you know throw peas at the wall and are reactive. Yeah, after yeah. all that, then yes, then then you're um, you're changing the dynamic of the relationship. Right. Right. Know? Yeah. Which is can be like a root canal, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That's <laughs> um, it's like with families and with intimate partners. Partners, probably right? The the, the hardest because mm. with friends, it's I mean, it's hard, but it's not that hard. Friends adjust. I, I feel like mm. friends have more capacity, like our best friends. Do you, you think know? they give more grace? Is that, or is it maybe do they, their expectation is a little uh, bit? Um, I just feel like with our friends, we could just get real very fast mm. and talk. Um, I guess it depends. Um, with our partners, um, this is a generalization, but um, we usually do life around our partner mm. or at our partner, mm. but to do life with our partner is terrifying. Mm. You know what I mean by that? So around, yeah, talk, as, talk more about that. So like, um, um, around our partner is uh, someone who doesn't want to express how how they feel mm. or like how they want to be loved. They don't want to rock the boat, right? You know, so it's a lot of stuff. Dancing around. You know, what do you want for lunch? And mm. you know, surfacey stuff. At a partner is iron fist. It's mm. you should do this or you know, 
um, it's a lot of defensiveness, mm. a lot of accusations, a lot of pointed fingers. With your partner is the vulnerability. Mm. You know, hey, I love you, but um, I need some space. Or it could be like, this is how I want you to touch me. Mm. Or I want, you know, whatever. Just ex- self-expression. Um, these are the problems I have. This is where I'm in my life. Uh, all the scary conversations that, you know. And do you think it's more challenging because there's a threat that you will be rejected? Yes, or like what is Yeah, uh, rejected, left. And if you're in a relationship where conflict um, isn't repaired well, mm. like if there's a lot of rupture and not a lot of repair, so the mm. space isn't safe, of course you're going to be scared to love with your partner. Right, you know? right. That's when you love around, you know? So, and I think with, with um, I mean, again, a generalization with, with, with Asian, but um, my gener- uh, generation and of course my parents, um, we weren't, we never went to therapy. We, were, we weren't taught how to hold a safe space. Right, you know? right. Like, my parents, you know, grew up in poverty, war stricken, you know, making their own shoes, like, yeah, you know, old yeah. school Korea. Came to America with five hundred dollars. Like they don't know what therapy is. Yeah, you know, yeah, this kind of language to them would be ridiculous. Yeah. Hi, ABGs. Support for today's episode comes from Honey Love. I usually have two types of bras in my wardrobe: ones for casual comfort and ones for formal situations. Honey Love is a bra that has broken that mold because sometimes it will go in my casual pile and sometimes it will go in my formal pile. Their bra has supportive bonding so you get lift, but it's also super comfortable because there's no underwire and the fabric is so soft. If you want to try them out, you can actually get 20% off your order with our exclusive link, honeylove.com slash ABG. Check them out at honeylove.com forward slash ABG. Okay, so back to this bra. Usually when I see mesh material on bras, I automatically think about how uncomfortable it's going to feel. And when I saw Honey Love's crossover bra, not gonna lie, I was like, this looks like a bra that I'm gonna want to take off immediately when I come home after a long day. But when I tried it on, I could seriously sleep in this bra. It gives all of the support of traditional bras without using underwire, which I love because underwire is so uncomfortable. It has all the trimmings of a sexy bra, but with the comfort and functionality of a sports bra. They also have incredibly comfortable shapewear, tanks, and leggings for everyday support. Treat yourself to the best bras on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com slash ABG. Use our exclusive link to get 20% off honeylove.com slash ABG. After you purchase, they ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them that we sent you. Treat yourself to Honey Love because you deserve it. Given that, like how, what was your journey like going into therapy? So I was, uh, I was in LA. I went to film school as a screenwriter. Um, and my, my marriage fell apart, realized I needed to change careers. Um, and so I became a therapist because, uh, I was talking to my own therapist, Mm. trying to save the marriage. And he was like, what do you want to do with your life if you can't make movies? And I said, uh, God, I don't want to do anything. And I was like, I want to do what you're doing. Like, I want to help yeah. people. If I can't via masses creatively, um, I want to do it one at a time. Mm. And I thought uh, that was the dream. And and I remember telling him like, man, if I could just, um, if I could just have an office and, you know, wear the slacks and, you know, have the coffee and just make six figures a year, I would be happy. Mm. And I remember him saying to me, you're never going to make six figures <laughs> as mm. a therapist. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, that's never going to happen. Yeah. And at that moment, I was like, because he was projecting his, ah, like his onto own, me. Yeah, yeah. Was like, you know. Um, but then once I became a therapist and uh, licensed, uh, I realized that's not what I wanted. Mm. So that wasn't me to right. sit in an office, in a nondescript office with bad art and just talk about, <laughs> like, <laughs> I tried it. Yeah, I tried tucking my shirt in. Yeah. And uh, um, I, I did everything from working in... Um, high-end treatment centers in Malibu mm. to um, having private practice and all this. And I was like, it doesn't feel right. This isn't yeah. like, and um, so then I got on Tumblr in 2010 yeah. and I just did it for fun. And I called it the angry therapist. Mm. And I just started talking about my, my journey post breakup. Yeah. Revelations. And I didn't think anyone would read it, um, but people started reading it and then they wanted um, me to answer their emails and then they wanted uh, sessions. Mm. And so I said, meet me at the coffee shop. Like mm. what? Or like, I, I would say like, meet me at, uh, uh, in Silver Lake, there's a lake that you walk around. Yeah. It's exactly 50 minutes to walk uh, or about an hour. Yeah. I said, meet me at the lake. And then I, so then that's the unconventional part. I started to meet people in public 
and I went casual over clinical. And this mm. was before coaching was a thing. Like yeah. the only coach then was like Tony Robbins. Right. Now coaching right. is huge because wellness is commercialized. But, right, right. And so I felt like I was doing something wrong. I mm. felt I was um, doing something shady, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Because you weren't supposed to like go walk with your clients. Right, right. But then their response was so amazing and they thought that was refreshing. And mm. then I noticed in public and coffee shops, as long as we were, you know, facing each other, right. we could have intimate, deep conversations and they didn't care about the people around them. And I was like, oh, this could actually work. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes I think maybe when you remove um, the kind of like formality around it, you yeah. can actually get deeper with people, right? And I noticed, I mean, going back to Solid Self, I noticed oh, this feels right to me. Mm. And so I just keep feeding that. And what happened in life was that turned into my full-time job. Mm. And then I stopped punching the clock. So it was like a transition. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. That, that's a good example of, so, you know, the wrinkle-free pants in the office with the silver balls and all that, that's very pseudo. That's what a therapist looks like. Right, right. right? And also be very, very neutral. Yes. Don't talk yeah. about your personal life. You know, tuck in your shirt. And uh, that felt very kind of gross to me. Mm. And it felt like uh, Clark Kent pushing, pushing a mail cart, as I say. I see, I see, yeah. And then when I was like jeans, t-shirt, on my motorcycle to coffee shop, yeah, I felt like I had a cape. Mm. And so I was like, that, that's interesting. Yeah. So I just, I didn't tell a lot of people about it because it was, it was not what you were supposed to do. Right, right. But I just kept feeding it. And then that led to, you know books and social media was invented and I just kind of poured it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that you, the storytelling of showing, you know, like feeling like you're punching in your card and it's a mm -hmm. bit of a putting on a cost, not a costume, but yeah. it's, yeah. It, it was the less authentic version of yourself yes. versus moving towards the thing that mm -hmm. made you feel like you had your, your superpower alive. Yeah. yeah. Most people don't do that. Yeah. And for me, mm -hmm. I got to say, if I was married and already had a life, mm -hmm. I don't think I would have done that. Right. Because things felt safe. Yes. It was because I had nothing. Mm. It's because I was divorced. It was because I was, you know, taking the bounce up. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. a lot of people who are, you know, like you going through a breakup, it's actually a great time to like really shift so many yeah. things, you know? I mean, when they say like when it rains, it pours, I feel like I, yeah. I, I'm trying to yeah. take that experience yeah. <laughs> uh, or that mindset, right? Yes. And And looking at when things... When something breaks, um, it's an opportunity to rebuild yeah. and uh, yeah. try to kind of like listen to the most like authentic voice that's inside that makes you yeah. feel more alive versus feeling like you're kind of doing something that is expected. Yeah. How many years was the relationship? It was actually only a one-year relationship. Okay. So it's very short, but it, it also was intense. We yeah. met, um, I'm 38, he was 45. We were like, we want a family. Uh, and okay. so, so you guys went fast. It was fast yeah. um, and it was a very like... Yeah, I thought I was, you know, walking towards a path that um, I thought I wanted. I think yeah. I still want, but maybe just in a different way. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I'm going a little off script here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bit of a, a personal therapy session for yeah. myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I do, I kind of want to go back to that line that you were referencing from Beef about um, oh, the Western, Western. Yeah. therapy not working on Eastern minds. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? And then I think especially for like Asian males mm. that like, you know, mm. I'm obviously I'm an Asian woman. So I want to kind of lean more into that perspective of being an Asian male yeah. and what it's like to come from Eastern culture um, and to have like Western therapy available to you. Yes. I mean, um, I don't think, I know when I went to therapy school, I was the, not only um, one of the few um, men studying to be a therapist, but also yeah. uh, I was the only minority. Um, so not a lot of, uh, men providing therapy, but also not a lot of men open to therapy. Yeah. I think it comes from the generational blueprint of, um, you know, uh, man up or it, or talking about your feelings is weak right? or right. we don't have time for that or it's a luxury, you know, um, with my parents' generation, I mean, I don't even know if they know what, what a therapist really does, you know, they, they, they they took advantage of the fact that um, I was going back to school, getting a degree. And so then they just told their friends I was a doctor. And I was like, I'm mm, not a doctor. Yeah, I see. They're trying to hook me up with nurses saying that I was a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> like to brag about their, to make it about them, brag, brag right, about their right. son. It's like, no, I'm not, I'm not actually, I don't have a PhD. I'm not a doctor. Um, but, you know, back then you went to therapy if you were quote unquote crazy. Right, right. And so um, there was a lot of stigma with that. And I, and I think, 
even though um, it's been a long time, I mean, even today, especially with men, still a lot of men don't, they, they don't, it means, because they, they see it as uh, there's something wrong with me. Right, you right. Know? Like a deficiency of some form. A deficiency or there, it's a form of surrender or mm -hmm. it's a weakness, um, you know, uh, the, the machismo. Um, in Korean culture, there, there's, uh, I don't know about this generation, but you know, when I was growing up, there's a lot of machismo. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We could work this out. What well, we don't need anyone else. What are you talking about? Right. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, very little, uh, looking inward or reflection on self, mm. you know, and then, you know, we work. That's what we do. We work or we right, study or right. we go grind. Mm. Um, who the fuck has time to talk about feelings in the room? Like, what do you do? What do you right. Do? Right. You know? I mean, what for the generation of people who might be listening, mm -hmm. um, if someone is having those thoughts going through their mind, like what would you, what would you offer? Or if they're, if they are not in maybe feeling the most, um, in the best place mm. and they feel resistance to, to seeking help in any way. Well, I think luckily today, um, because it just, it's not like the therapist isn't the only choice. Right. Yeah. Um, for example, the explosion of coaches, right? So there's dating coaches, there's divorce recovery coaches, there's, you know, coach, uh, coaches with business addiction. There, there's bridges now, hmm. or they could go into some form of, um, you know, ice exposure. Well, something wellness, a retreat hmm. can be a bridge. Right. And right. then they have some kind of experience uh, at the retreat and they're like, oh, now maybe I'm going to be ready for a therapist. So if you're not ready for a therapist now, there might be other things you can do that makes you feel um, more comfortable, right, like right. an active thing. Yeah. So like a retreat or one of the things that it's, it's just, uh, that's very therapeutic for me is going um, on a dirt bike trip with uh, 12 other men. Mm, yeah. Because what happens is conversations happen right, over the right. campfire and it can actually be very therapeutic. Yes. Yeah. You know? I like, I mean, offering that it's it's reframing our mindset around what therapy is. And yeah. um, if you're saying like seeking wellness practices, seeking coaches, mm -hmm. to me, that just means if you're feeling somewhat like disconnected with yourself, like what are activities that you can do to help feel more connected? I mean, way, right? starting or, with the the first step of the, the shallow end of the pool would be just journaling. Yeah. Okay, yeah. just write shit down then. Yeah. You know? I don't know about you, but it feels like a lot of my friends are now getting on that baby train. If you have a friend who is also expecting or have little ones still in diapers, I always recommend Pampers Swathers. With Pampers Swathers, you can also rest assured that this diaper will prevent up to 100% of leaks, even blowouts. Swathers has dual leak guard barriers at the legs to help protect where leaks happen most. And they have a blowout barrier, which is an innovative back pocket built into the diaper to help prevent those messy leaks up the back. Did you know that on average, babies will use up to 8,000 plus diapers before becoming potty trained? That is a lot. That's why Pampers Diaper Stash is the hottest baby gift for 2024. So give a gift to a loved one that says, we see you and we've got you. Pampers Diaper Stash is an online diaper fund that all parents with little ones will love. You can organize friends and family to contribute to a group gift of an online stockpile that never has to run out. Pampers Diaper Stash is great because it takes the guesswork out of choosing what size and how many diapers to gift. It's so easy to do, and it's the gift that always fits. Do you find, I mean, for you, you said it was like the motorcycle, but are there kind of these like more like traditional therapy approaches or things that you would like, what are some exercises or tasks that for you are helpful? Uh, for me, uh, a lot of getting out of, I remember going through my divorce and reminding myself every day. Um, out of my head, out of my house, out of my head, out of my house. And that was mm. my go-to. Yeah, yeah. Um, when we're going through or healing from a breakup, we're in our, I mean, it's, we're spinning constantly. Our, yes, yeah, And yeah. we're reminded, you know, songs, yeah. music, whatever, that, that restaurant. Um, and then we're playing back a lot of what ifs and fuck, I wonder if it, if I acted this way or I wonder where we would be now and, you know, all these things. And now we're um, not living in the present. Right. So right. lots of distorted thought, lots of spinning. And then behind every thought is a feeling. Right. And then you start playing back the highlight reel. And it's just a lot of mm. lot of distortion, right? Yes. Um, yeah. And then you start sinking. And then mm. you get depressed. And then you eat too much. And then, you, you know, all that stuff. So out of your head. And then when I say out of your house, uh, just have smart feet. So the the way that the, the, the CrossFit thing worked for me was uh, CrossFit was brand new. And this was 2010. Um, 
I didn't have any friends, so I just I, I needed to go somewhere. And and and, and CrossFit had a, a building community, right? So yeah. any place where there's a community. So whether that's rock climbing or yoga. Or, yoga is my jam. Yeah, yeah yoga is <laughs> your jam. Uh, anything where um, if you can just get there, it's the structure of it, that one hour mm-hmm. uh, plus friends or anything, the energy of that will carry you. Mm. So just get there. Yeah, and so yeah. I always thought, okay, out of my house, out of my head. And that's kind of how I got through the days. Yeah. And then it's like you string enough days together where um, the old doesn't have as, as much power over you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> and then you meet new people, you make new friends, uh, you hear other stories, all that stuff. You know? yeah. yeah. I mean, um, I want to talk a little bit about your book uh, you wrote called Single on Purpose. Yes. Redefine Everything, Find Yourself First. Yeah. How is being alone and fulfilled foundational to a more meaningful life for you? Mm. Um, and how does that then make you, I guess, more prepared to enter relationships yeah. again? Yeah. Um, I, I also want to say uh, real quick that it's it doesn't stay single forever. So I'm mm. not saying that um, stay single, don't date anyone forever. Yeah. I'm saying find yourself first. I think a lot of people kind of go from one lily pad to another. Um, and when they're single, they're uncomfortable. So they they get into relationships that are uh, not honest or, or they're lukewarm and they stay in it because they don't want to be alone. Mm. And uh, you're bringing uh, more of a pseudo side to you to the table. Right, you right. Know? And so being single and when I was single, I think I spent about five years, as they say, dating myself. Yeah. You know, I got busy trying to discover wh- who I am, what I like, uh, getting comfortable with self. And uh, it, it took time. Yeah. You know? What are some ways that we can offer for people? Um, and I know it's like, it's going to be different for everyone, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But like some of the ways in, like when we think about dating ourselves, like how do we, how do we get to a place where we feel good about ourselves? How mm-hmm. do we be able to feel that we're attractive, that we're yeah. like a worthy individual yeah. and um, we know I, what we have to offer? <laughs> I, I think that stuff comes in moments. Mm. I don't think it's like, okay, I'm ready. I like myself now. I'm confident. I mean, uh, I think there's an ebb and flow. And I think in moments uh, you have where you're like, oh, uh, I, I I sent my dad to voicemail mm. or I um, called in sick because I'm taking care of myself or I spent money on that trip to go by myself mm. or I bought a motorcycle or I did things for me. I got the tattoo or I asked someone out. Yeah, yeah. You know, or I told this person how I wanted to be touched or whatever it is. Like it comes yeah. in moments where, um, you are respecting yourself. You're giving yourself what you need. Um, I think there's also kind of like the it's like this idea of reparenting yourself. Mm. You know, the the inner child work. Yeah, yeah. I I like that you focus on moments. Um, because I think oftentimes in when we think about like, oh, I need to change things up, or like, I need yeah. to shift everything about this habit, this thing that I do every day, yeah. or I'm going to yeah. do um, like a uh, like run a mar- like a big yeah. thing or something extreme like that. things, extreme yeah, things, yeah. or like really like long term big habit changes. But yeah. I like that it can be a very simple like sending someone to voicemail yeah. is a small way, and um, it's like um, an absence of an action, really, right? Yes, but that yes. that can be a big way to take and, care and of yourself. I think it's the um, it's the little things that become big, right? Mm. So it's moments like that where you realize, oh, that I am different or that I have some courage or that mm. I do like myself. Um, I still have insecurities. I'm still on a journey and, I, and I'm 50, you know, um, but I'm definitely a lot more me uh, because I've allowed myself to be me, but also I've put the reps in, right? you know, um, I think it's a daily practice. It's kind of sad to even say it's a daily practice to be you. Like but it's, it's hard. very real. Yeah. yeah Actually, in our I want to go back to that. What it, when you say you put the reps in, what is what does that mean exactly? All the decisions every day. So like the, the mm. sending your, your parents to voicemail, buying a motorcycle. Um, I went to Italy mm. alone, you know, wow, and, and yeah. before I used to think that was a waste of money. Mm. Like oh, you do that when you're successful. But I I've never right, traveled. Right, right. So I gave myself that. You um, gave yourself the permission. Permission. Say, yeah. Um every Friday I I uh I, I started this thing called Fuck It Friday. Fuck it Friday. So every I like Friday, I, I give myself something that I feel like I deserve. So that could be the donut, mm-hmm. or it could be like I'm going to the beach, or yeah. it could be you know whatever, right? Uh, the way that you talk to yourself—that's a big, mm. you know. Yeah, I yeah. think we're very uh, harsh critics to ourselves. Yes. Um. Oh, you you know you're an idiot. You're a piece of shit. You're whatever it is, right? Yeah. Uh, stopping all of that or, or trying to, 
you know, putting the reps in there. Mm. Um, movement and physical activity has been huge for me. So knowing when to push yourself uh, and knowing, like, and you have to decide, like, at, at what is, because I, I, I tend to work out really hard. Yeah. Um, so what is self-care and what is self-loathing, <laughs> you know? Mm. Ah, so That's it, a really yeah. important distinction. Are you punishing yourself? Or are you challenging yourself? Yeah. You know? How, like, what's what's like a, an example of the last time where you realized, oh, I think like you, maybe you went yeah. into it thinking this is a self-care routine and you're realizing oh, this is Oh, it happens all the time. Um, so the thing about uh, uh, CrossFit is that there is a scoreboard and everything's mm. for time and it's very competitive. Yeah. So um, that could get dangerous. So yeah. I could do something strictly uh, for the scoreboard. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to for what I think is good for me. Ah, so, okay. Yes. So it's the so, intention or where your mind is at when you're doing the, the Yeah. Activity. And you know, some days I think, <laughs> uh, realistically, some days um, um, you're going to do things that are uh, uh, might not be good for you. Right, you right. Know, uh, pushing yourself too hard, mm. um, lifting a weight that could have hurt you, like yeah. all of that, you know? And then um, some days it's going to be very good for you. And I think it's cumulative. Mm. I don't think it's like judging every day. Right, So right. I think it's all about kind of um, awareness and non-judgment. Mm. Oh, that's what I just realized. I was very competitive. Um, I did this workout just to try to get on the leaderboard. Not, it wasn't really for me. Right. Just right. noticing it. Mm. And then you deciding if tomorrow you want that same experience or not, you know, mm. and how that affects you. I like that. I yeah. like that. Yeah. I definitely, I, I resonate a lot with sometimes having that harsh voice in your head yeah. and even just realizing that that's what's happening yeah. can be very challenging. But the moment you realize it to not then get more done on yourself for having that voice, yeah. but just to see, well, tomorrow then I'm going to change it. And yeah. that's small. Once again, it's like maybe the absence of an action, the absence of doing that. that Do you think form. with um, Asian parents, it's more predominant? I mean, you know, I mean, since, you know, straight A's. Yeah. Good grades, great college. Um, and I was the kid that uh, was a C student, horrible grades. and so. Uh, they, I mean, I remember since I was 10, uh, spinning on my head, they would throw books at me saying, you have to get good grades. You yeah, have to get yeah. good grades. And I think for them, that was always the ticket out. Yes. Because they never had an education, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I understand, like, it comes, it's, it's like it comes from a place of, like, fear for them and all protection yeah. for their child because yeah. this is, you know, how. But then, unfortunately, you start to realize that that becomes your voice, kind of. <laughs> yes. Maybe a bit of, you know, yes. your parents. And now you're, you know, now if you're not in an AP class, you're judging yourself. Yeah, now if, you yeah. You know, I didn't go to UC school and I felt really stupid. I was, yeah. You know, I went to Cal State Northridge and then. And that, um, and that evolves because the AP class in your in high school becomes something different yeah. when you're in your 20s, becomes yeah. something different in your 30s, 40s. And it's like noticing that and right. being able to give yourself permission to separate that voice that's theirs maybe yeah. versus your own. Yeah. The AP class um, later can be the corner office. Yes. Or the promotion you're getting. Exactly. Or, right. Yeah. It all ripples. Yeah. Yeah. That's very insightful. <laughs> it, it, it could also be the, um, you know, at a certain age, I need to have, um, you know, the what, the 2.2 kids. And the, yes, exactly. The matching BMWs and the house. Yeah. Or... I am not successful or I'm a failure or I'm, you know, all that stuff. Too. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I'm curious how you, like, for you, how did you reframe your idea of like family life and what you wanted in a future with a partner? Yeah. So when I was married, I got married at 29. Um, I was chasing the big offense. I thought, yeah. okay, here's my wife. This is it. This is forever. Now we're going to have kids, blah, blah, blah. Uh, none of that worked out. I got a divorce, which, yeah. you know, which I wasn't expecting. And so I had to redefine. Um, so I went back to school at 35. Uh, so everything now came later. Right. So today I'm 50 with um, a four-year-old daughter. That's you know? so beautiful. Yeah. And of course there's parts of me, it's like, oh, fuck, man. I'm going to be, when she's in high school, I'm going to, they're going to be like, dude, your grandpa's here. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be on a motorcycle, but you know, I have white hair and, and I just can't imagine like when she's in high school, how old I'm going to be. I'll be in my 60s. Mm. But then I look at it like, um, could I have been a better dad mm. i was like no way i like in my 20s 30s i, I would have been um, very reactive mm. i just wouldn't have been a good dad yeah yeah um, um so at 50 i'm a lot more calmer i'm a lot more uh, i'm definitely not perfect but i'm a better dad now than i you know so um i look at it that way and then i also look mm -hmm. at it like um my whole story has been uh, a late bloomer you know uh f finding like i did my first squad at 35 went back to school at 35 um, I think I sold my first book and I was in my forties. Like yeah, everything yeah. has come late for me, you know? I mean, it's funny that you're focused on it being late. I feel like that's actually 
I, I think of now like 40s and 50s kind of like a prime. Well, it's period. like a generational yeah. thing. Yeah. I think, I think you're because you're a millennial, right? Mm -hmm. Or are you Z? Uh, millennial. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm Gen X. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so you were with me. Yeah. You're thinking. 50s very old. Yeah. Um, I grew up with uncles who were 50 and they were, I thought, oh my God, they're done. Yeah. Yeah. With millennials and Gen Z, I think 40s and 50s is, yeah, like you said, prime. We look you, at that as the prime. Yeah. 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 So, um, and everything that you say makes sense. I think that. Um, I need to surround myself with millennials. You do. <laughs> you <laughs> come hang out yeah. with us more. <laughs> yeah. Then I get that echo. You're in your prime. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But I think I first want to dive a little bit more into uh, vulnerability. Yes. Because I think that especially with Asian culture in particular and probably Asian males, yeah. it's I think it's is even more challenging to be vulnerable. Yeah. Um, and we already talked a little bit about that, but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about how you have been able to start practicing vulnerability mm. more in your life mm. as, um, as you've evolved. So starting with the word, um, you know, there's words in self-help that um, I think because of, well, Instagram and social media, they, they, they just get so overused, like narcissism. Yeah, that one's coming you know, up a lot. Um, there's attachment styles are really big. Uh, th these words that trend and vulnerability yeah. is one of those words where um, now I, when I hear it, it's like, it's been so overused. Like, what does it even mean now? Right? Yeah, right. And so I want to think of a Let's different start way, with their, yeah. Yeah, a different definition. Um, I think showing yourself. Showing yourself is, mm. is uh, to me, what vulnerability looks like. So it's not just about, people think vulnerability just means you're, you're you know, expressing how you feel. Yeah. That could be a part of it. Vulnerability, be, like, like the way that I practice therapy is very vulnerable. Mm. It's scary. It's showing myself, uh. right? Um, getting a tattoo because it means something to you mm. um, against, um, or a certain tattoo that you think people may not like. That can be vulnerable, mm. right? Getting on a motorcycle is vulnerable. Right. So it's not just expressing how you feel. <laughs> be right. vulnerable. Tell us how you feel. Of course, that's obvious. Right, right. Um, But how you show up in the world, how you show yourself, um, not br breaking promises you've made to you mm. is vulnerable. Yeah. You know, I mean, the pattern I'm seeing in the examples that you gave is like where there's some potential of you getting hurt mm -hmm. or um, where there might be a sense of fear mm -hmm. and then being able to kind of like step over that. Yes. One thing um, I've said uh, um, many times earlier uh, in my life was um, I, I, I love these promises that you make to yourself after an expired relationship. I call them expired relationships that breakups. Mm. And one of them is to not exchange uh, your truth for membership. Mm. So whatever that membership is, to yeah, not yeah. exchange your truth. And so I think that is a form of vulnerability mm. to stand on your truth instead of suppress. So that could look like, I mean, that could be in fashion. That right, could be you right. wearing something right. that, that, that you feel is comfortable. For you. Like yeah. I'm wearing overalls. This I is a good example. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is, um, 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 I've all, I always thought growing, like I've, I've, I've liked overalls, but yeah. I was too scared to wear them. Mm. I thought that um, you have to be tall. And, and oh, white and skinny. Oh. And you have to be an artist or you have yeah, to be. Yeah. And so um, a, a year ago, I got these and I was like, fuck, should I wear these? And then I, I put them on and yeah. I had to go through that whole thing. Like, yeah, oh, like I'm scared. So I go outside. I feel like, an, uh, like, a, <laughs> like, a, like I feel like I look like Willy Wonka. Where, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, and now I'm okay with it. And then, you know, and I've gotten a few compliments. And so now yeah. just whatever. But. Um, as something I just picked because it's a great example of yeah. something that you may not think about filed under vulnerability. Yes. Is, yeah. Yeah. Is, is a man wearing overalls. Yeah. You know? I think that clothing and like fashion are incredible ways to yeah. express like your yeah. own personal yeah. voice or your, your sense of whatever. And um, yeah, I definitely have. I think I feel like post breakup, it is making me just reevaluate what I want out of life and who mm -hmm. I am and all of that. Mm -hmm. And it is in the small decisions of even like, what do I wear? Yeah. And is it okay? And they add up. They they, add they up. very much add up. I have a merm, a man yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and was it? I was wondering if your hair is natural. No, oh. I fuck. I wish it was. Um, <laughs> I have straight. I have your hair. The straight, I have straight yeah. Asian hair. And well, it's a, I have some like weird waves. In oh, you it, have some though. waves. Yeah, yeah. That and doesn't... of course, you always want what you want what you don't have. Yes. And so growing up, yeah, yeah, all all the all the white kids had the the cool wavy uh, surfer hair. Yeah. And I had this, you know, starting with a bull haircut yeah. onto <laughs> Aqua Ned and trying to, and so hair has always been something that I, uh, as someone who's creative, wanting to do something different. Yeah, with. yeah. And then um, two years ago, my friend, uh, she was styling my hair. She's like, "I'm going to give you a perm." I was like, "Fuck no." <laughs> 
<laughs> and I thought about like my Korean grandmas and stuff. I was like, yeah, no, yeah. I was like, trust me. Mm. And then, uh, and now I'm like, oh my God, this is the hair that I always wanted. Yeah. Like, I thought it was natural. I don't, no, I don't it's actually... not natural. It's fake. It's fake <laughs> like these oral. But, uh, but again, that's another example of connecting to self. Yes. Yeah. So connecting the part of you. Um, and you know, it's, since 12. I love that you talked to the inner dialogue of you thought perm and then you thought, yes, there was like the cool kids, but then also there's like the Korean grandma, Korean grandma right? And yep. I resonate yeah. with that dialogue a lot. Now when I'm making like choices of things, mm -hmm. I'll see all of the, the, maybe there was like the inner voice of me wanting that thing, but then the other voice judging like yes. what that could mean. Right. Um, or what people think of or it. Or what people yeah. will think of it. Yeah. yeah. So I like, I'm taking away your message of vulnerability, being able to listen to that kind of like quiet mm -hmm. voice mm -hmm. um, and to... To, I mean, I'm going to acknowledge that there's like other external voices or fear oh, yeah. of whatever, but yeah. being able to kind of, um, to choose my own and to do it anyway. Yeah. And yeah. Which is, it's hard to do. It's it is. Do, yeah. yeah. What is, I mean, I guess, is there, what's like some advice that you could share with me if it's like other times I'm having those like back and forth voices? I think, well, I, I think it gets easier and this is why I use the word reps. Um, mm. You got to swim too far to turn back. Uh, so I swim too far to turn back. Yeah. So there's like a tipping point, right? Mm -hmm. So like um, me being on social media for, you know, uh, the last over decade, um, of course, there's stuff I want to take down. Of course, yeah. there's videos that are embarrassing. But I, at this point, um, if I combine my, my podcast episodes with videos with, I mean, it's, it's like, it's, it's, end, it's hundreds of thousands. I mean, I can't go and delete the stuff. Yeah, yeah. So there's almost a surrendering. Ah, so I swam like too that. far to turn back. Yeah. So now there is only one gear, which is forward and forward, true. Yeah. I'm not going to go back and try to delete things. Those yeah. Those are chapters yeah. of my life. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so in, in like that, just using that as kind of an example, um, putting in the reps and um, in moments, uh, doing things that feel honest to you so many times that you just, I'm, this is the new me. It's like mm. becomes the norm, you know? Yeah. I can't turn back. I like that. I swim too far. Swim far enough so that I can't turn back. Yeah. Like yeah. going to the island is closer than going back home. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think in my mind, like, what are what are those things for me? Um, yeah. And maybe for our, our uh, viewers and our listeners, too, to think about what for you, if you're going through something, is is that thing that you can do where mm -hmm. you're swimming further, mm -hmm. far enough so that it's hard to come back. Yeah. And to yeah. make the permission. Or you don't give yourself a choice. I mean, your guys' story with this podcast may be one where you started it and then there were, you know, after a certain amount of episodes and ups and downs or whatever, you guys were like, dude, we've done so much of this. There's yeah. only, there's no only choice forward, but to go forward. To move forward, yeah. yeah. There might be different, yeah. but we're not going back. Yes. You know, yeah. we're not taking it down. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, Sean, for being here with us today. Yeah, of course. Um, is there anything else that you want to share with our, our viewers? Any parting words? No, I just love, um, you know, the the uh, the experience here that I'm having that I, um, I wanted to give myself and also why I wanted to be here. Um, your podcast is, although it's not just for Asian people. Yeah. It hangs on, I mean, Asians in your top, in your, in the title of your podcast and someone who grew up pushing that away mm. and being embarrassed and not embracing my own culture. Yeah. And, and, and uh, being on something like this makes me, uh, in a strange way, connect back to self. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, I totally, yeah. Because I'm, I'm like excited and proud to be here, not embarrassed. Yes. Or else I wouldn't be here. Yeah. So. Well, thank you for saying yeah, that. It's therapeutic yeah. just to be a, a part of this show. That's amazing. I, I love mean, that we were able to provide you some therapy. And I feel like you actually, <laughs> this has felt like kind of a therapy session mm -hmm. for me too. Yeah. Um, can you share with everyone where, if they're looking for you, they want to follow, what are, anything uh, that you want to share with anyone? Yeah, just um, across the board, the angry therapist. Angry Therapist. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Sean, yeah. for being with us. Thank you for having me. And with that, we'll catch you all on the next episode. Bye.